how to approach OER. I mean, our big problem is we've got sort of massive teachers in mostly higher education who may be interested in OER and have started looking at uh, the stuff we're doing and so on, but how do they get started? Mm -hmm. How do you start with it? How do you create open? What are the, how do you create openness in a department that has previously been closed? I think there's always two approaches. One of them is the top down. One of them is the bottom up. Right now, we're talking about starting another process where I'm from, in trying to get the community college, higher ed, and the schools into the same system. One of the challenges with any of these things, and we all saw this with wikis when we first started is that there are a bunch of different systems, people are expected to learn how to do something, and then two years later, the project that you did has gone away, and somebody's dealing with the next person. And frankly, a lot of the people who were really invested in the beginning, who saw some potential in this, have gotten tired of that. Mm -hmm. I think the first thing that you need to be able to commit to anybody, regardless of whether you're going broad-based or in a specific, is that you have a long-term plan. And I, I just, I would hesitate to start any OER project now where I can't say, you know, we've got five-year plan, a uh, eight-year plan, where we're going to be doing this for a long time. Because it's a lot of work. There's big demands from teachers, from the people who get involved in it. And I've been part of so many of the of, of sort of dreamy projects over the years where people had great goals and great intentions but didn't really have the plan nailed down. And I think that for a lot of people, seeing how they're part of something big, something that's long-term, even if they're at the beginning of that process, is really important for them to understand what their investment means. I think in our context we're actually kind of way behind Dave in my institution, um, you know the kind of situation that Dave's talking about and we're still at the stage where we've got pockets of activity, yeah. so you know individual academics publishing things openly online, slides on slide share, opening up the classrooms, but it's not at all a planned coordinated no. approach. But I think the thing that is changing things is often um, coming, uh, you know, things are often financially driven or marketing driven, aren't they? And I think mm -hmm. in our university that has generally, we are seeing a cultural shift with regards openness as the university mm -hmm. is starting to see the benefits of putting videos on YouTube. But it's, it's actually yeah. coming from that sort of top down thing. And then alongside that, we are very, very supportive of open access journals as a university, and it's something our vice chancellor in particular is known for. Yeah. So we're, we're in this kind of, you know, got the triangle at the moment between the push towards open access in terms of scholarly activity, um, opening up the promotion for the actual <laughs> university itself and an individual practice. So I think that I'd expect us to have a coordinated plan, as Dave's describing, in the next few years. I just think mm. we're just, the, the ground's fertile now. And oh I think God. we're not necessarily answering your actual question, which is how to do it grassroots. Yeah. Uh, mm. But I'm going to make another not grassroots comment, and that's that when we look at the way that people, there's a financial argument, and certainly that does exist. Uh, there's another one as well, and that's that a lot of the funding for higher ed still comes in part from the government. There's less than there used to be, but a lot of it's still there. And one of the things that we're being asked is, what are you doing for the community? Why, like, if we're going to be giving you however much of a percentage of your school's um, sort of operating budgets coming from the government, what exactly are you giving back? And I think this is also something that institutions and schools can say, you know, this is part of our process, this is part of what we do. And then you have potentially those partnerships between um, schools and universities that help produce some of that content as well. I think anytime you ask anybody to do it on their own, um, it's going to be that much tougher. If you can have the K-12 science schools working with the universities in science, and you can make those kinds of partnerships. And then people can feel like this is part of their responsibility as academics. It's part of because. I just don't see how you can put more weight on the top of the teachers. There's, there's no more room in what they're doing for them to take more responsibility at this point. But I think if we can get help to them from various different places where we can get them to have supports from experts and supports from the government and supports from, you know, the community even, where people like, you know, my grade one student, my grade one kid, his teacher blogs what they're doing all week. And just that sort of... We're super supportive of that and try to make sure that all the other parents are okay to make sure that they can start that process of openness and sometimes that's where it begins. Mm -hmm. You know, This is what we're doing this week. There's nothing contentious in that. There's nothing, you're not creating a textbook. You're getting into the process of openness, yeah. right? And you're allowing the parents into the conversation. You're teaching us as parents how to engage with the school. 
so that they can be that much more comfortable with that process, teacher can, in the next step of the process too. So. In a way, the key from both of you is that there has to be, there has to also be a top-down approach. There has to be approval from the top, or at least to get that approval, you can, you can appeal to things that they 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 value. The that by becoming more open, we will give more value to the community. That's one yeah. of the values that I think most university leaders can. Can, yeah. can latch on to they, 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 yes that's important to us we want to create contact with industry with the local community with the region's development mm. by being open we're helping people to learn about what we're doing we're, we're sharing our knowledge I think sometimes though we, um, we, we need something as simple as a database that just enables people to find this stuff yeah you know because we're having this conversation now and I'm thinking mm. about my colleagues in acoustics that have been putting, one colleague in particular that has been making videos in relation to acoustic phenomena for the last sort of 10 years and yeah. putting them online, those videos have got hundreds of thousands of views. Yeah. I've never heard him use the term OER or Open Educational no. Resources, and yet these resources are used around the world. So, you know, I think there's an issue there. We talk about OER, but there are lots of OERs and out we, there. We yeah. met that guy 15 minutes ago, right? Yeah. Michael, yeah. who is from, yeah. who's, yeah. I don't know what the town is called. Yevla. Yevla. Mm. And he's saying, you know, I'm getting word from students from around Sweden who are calling me up and saying, I don't even need to open my textbook anymore. Mm. All I need to do is go and watch your videos, and I completely understand the things that are required of me. Now, does he use the word OER? Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, but probably when he started, he mm. wasn't Too doing relevant. that. Yeah. It doesn't matter. All he was doing was sharing what he's doing and making it available to other people. And again, there are some people in, in any of our cultures who still think they should be paid for every bit of content they have. Yep. And I don't think there's any sense in trying to convince those people. Mm -hmm. At some point, we have success models now at the micro level with people like Mikhail. At the macro level, um, in my country, British Columbia is going op is going yep. OER, Washington State, in the United States. Those examples are there now. I think that you can put together a, a coherent pitch that says, here's what it looks like on the micro level. Here are examples of it happening at the macro level. Here's the amount of money they're talking about saving. And, I mean, when my, in my country, we have you know science textbooks that are 10 and 12 years old in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem, Yeah. right? If we assume that our, our classrooms are about content, then it's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, but even still, um, you know, we've got, the, the, we have to make allowances for those textbooks. And you could say that there's a learning opportunity there. But broadly speaking, I think the argument for holding on to them is getting less and less all the time. Caveat being that it's still not easy to keep technology running inside of schools now, right? It, you can't undersell how hard it is to get a laptop in every kid's hand, yeah. how hard it is to keep the technology working inside the classroom. Mm -hmm. It's still a challenge, and I think we were talking about this today as well. You have to be honest with people about the challenges that OER brings as well, because there are advantages on this side, but on the other side, you know, um, how do you get all the content from an OER updated and onto a Kindle? Well, it takes some work. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to have a good plan for how to do that, because it doesn't just happen on its own. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Especially at scale, it's easy mm. to get. It's easy to do with the uh, hey, we got these two classrooms doing it. But once you want to have 150 classrooms doing it, you know. And you mentioned the the problem of the the search problem. Mm. Uh, we oh, yeah. we give people some tips of great places to find educational resources, and but I mean they're like there's there's lots of silos, but we still Absolutely. haven't cracked how to find the stuff. Uh, yeah. You don't just Google OER. Well, you can Google OER, but it, it, it's an advanced search, and it's yeah. not always so. It's not always so accurate. But I mean, it is hard to find. Yeah. And so, in a way, that's the that's the next problem. They can say, "Yes, I like this idea, but how do I find the stuff?" Well, I mean, we were talking to a very, very experienced technologist today, an hour and a half ago, mm. who looked at us and said, "Oh, I have this picture of my slide deck. Uh, I don't know what the rights are. What do you think?" And we went didn't you check on the rights before mm. you put it in your slide deck? And this very People experienced technologist yeah. didn't check, never thought to check, never no. occurred to him. I would never pull a picture, but I mean, if this person doesn't know, yeah. Yeah. and the thing, the key to OER is understanding licensing, yeah. right? At yeah. some point yeah. you need to understand what that is. Yeah. And that's, that's not a message that's trickling down because the understanding of licensing, as much as I hate the fact that we have this licensing regime in the first place, in order to understand licensing, you need to have a subtle understanding of the laws, and it doesn't help you 
Like it doesn't get your class done. Mm. It doesn't get you to the chalk face, right? No. So it's making people stop. And in this person's mm. case, it's yeah. kind of shocking. Yeah, yeah. But getting them to stop and go, no, 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 no. This actually matters. Once you, you only need to understand it once. Yeah. Once you do, you'll be fine. But that's, I think, is another issue. And taking that up with the kid, with the with the kids, the oh. students. Yeah. Mm. I mean, because they don't know this either. And how would they? Well, it's, and I've actually found that my learners are way more equipped to deal with the production of OERs than many academics oh, yeah. because yeah. we spend time working around issues around licensing, copyright. So they're all very familiar with Creative Commons licensing. They're really? in a position, yeah, yeah. Okay. So my learners choose whether or not to license all of their work or their blogs or anything. Lots of them choose to go down the CC route because mm. they just think it's it's fantastic for yeah. them. So, um, but I've got to say that some of the most powerful OERs that I kind of use in my everyday practice are things that have actually been produced by learners themselves. Yeah, yeah. You know, what I love about that is the fact that if you are supervising a project, for instance, um, you kind of have, you know, a set list of projects and they go out to students and students uh, over semesters will pick the same project title and you kind of get the same project every time. When they're publishing the uh, projects online, um, then each successive student is able to build on the work of the mm. student before. And so things move on so much more quickly, the ideas develop more quickly. They're not reinventing the wheel in the same way. So as I say, if moving away from the sort of almost learning objects idea and looking at you know knowledge as this kind of living, breathing organism, that's where I think OERs are really, really effective. Yeah. And as I say, I think the learners have a huge role to play and in that. Important distinction between curriculum and content you're making mm. there. Um, and I think that that's one of those that that we often a distinction we often don't clear up because in one sense we talk about how a course is structured, how things get organized, how it gets in there, and then the actual day to day piece to piece can be a different conversation entirely. Mm -hmm. um, the from a from a governmental perspective, they're going to be looking at the global issue, right? Yeah, how do yeah. we organize a structure yeah. whereby instead of buying textbooks every year, we're putting that. Five hundred thousand dollars into this project over here, mm. right? That's one thing. On the other side, because you still need to structure. If you take the textbook out of a lot of classrooms, there's no structure to the yeah, classroom anymore. Yeah. So you need to replace it with something. Yeah. I mean, not because I think you can't have unstructured classrooms, but because you need to do this gradually. Like you're not going to. Mm. There's no, no you way you're ever going to sell change when what you say is, "What we're going to do is stop everything we're doing today, and tomorrow we're going to bring the dogs into the classroom, mm. and they're going to teach." It's, you yeah. can't do it. Yeah. Right? So I think that there's that part, and on the other side, totally what you're talking about with the student supported stuff, and I, I, I still don't do enough of that. Mm. And I think, because every time it happens, it is always, like you say, it's always powerful. People always understand better. And who better to explain something to someone else than somebody who has just learned it? Yeah, absolutely. Who has just come to terms with what that thing might mean. Yeah. And they go, look, I was working on this, yeah. and this is what I figured out over here. And often they're way more passionate about it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Even yeah. Getting the students to design the course, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. And the next yeah. term's course is the course that you lot designed. Yeah. yeah. And they will then refine yeah. that course yeah. and totally. pass it. The, yeah. the courses can be passed on and material can be recycled. Yeah. But that's a key for the, the OER development we see. There's a lot of studies indicate that where lots of people are producing good stuff. Mm. Yeah, reuse. But nobody's re reusing it. People no. don't trust other people's work. Mm. that people are very reluctant to use someone else's resources. But is that because they don't trust it or because they're worried that people might think that they're incompetent if they haven't invented their a, own, yeah. you know? There's a, the, um, this culture shift where yeah, it's all yeah. right to use someone else's. You're not being yeah. lazy by using it. There's that, yeah, be, get afraid of being branded. Yeah. I've had this fight with David Wiley, who is one of those sort of founder, I wouldn't say founders of OER, but one of the sort of originators of a lot of this conversation. And he always talks about the tension between generalizability and specificity. And this is where OER always runs into trouble. Is that if you want your thing to be reused, you need to generalize it. Yep. So it can work for lots of people. Mm. But once you generalize it, it loses the real directionality yep. that you want to yep. have in a piece that you're using. Yep. And the further specific you are, the less number of people it's going to be useful yeah, to. Yeah. So you always end up in this place where you're trying to, to, to fit inside that spectrum somewhere. And as a teacher, or as sort of people who are encouraged teachers, do we want to be encouraging them to market their OERs so that they're the most reusable? Or do we want them to be creating stuff mm. that's contextual to the work that that's they're doing? Smart, yeah. So there's that challenge. And I think the other one is, 
as teachers still aren't working in networks, mm. they don't have the literacies to do the verification yeah. that, like if I saw something and I looked at it and said Helen Keegan on it, I would hit play and play to my classroom without even looking at it. Yeah. Because I know her work. Trust. I, I have that trust in her yeah. work the same as I do with a lot of other people. Yeah. It, it would be an adult classroom. I don't <laughs> want to do that. But um, there is... Those they're not accustomed to those kinds of trust networks and developing no. those trust networks. They do in their you know if teacher X in their in their staff room said here try this yeah they, they would be yeah. they feel comfortable with going to do that. But we have to build those trust networks mm. and that's you know there's uh, there's a lot of work there yeah. <laughs> trying to get people to see the world in that kind of. And again, way. first of all, you got to get them out there. Yeah, well, there you're back to the same conversation. Back to the yeah. getting right. them to dare to connect. As yeah, that's right. But it's amazing how many. Um, lecturers, I think specifically, you know, people in HG are putting their course design and course notes online in, mm. say, open Google Docs that can be found from anywhere, but they're just not calling them OERs. No, I mean, and yet they're we... reusable. The yeah. license creator comments, but as I say, how do you find them? You find mm. them because you might be looking for a certain term, or so. I just think that you know the, the database and the metadata is also an issue here. Could be also we, we we end up getting stuck in our own alphabet soup, and we mm. um, we we keep calling all all these cherished concepts we have have got nice abbreviations or mm. complicated names, which means that we sort of alienate the ordinary teachers. Who's yeah. that sounds very complicated. Yeah. I don't even want to know about it. So OERs yeah. and MOOCs and you know everything yeah. else. That's always the issue with is jargon, the, isn't it? Yeah, we're we're yeah. we're, we're, we're isolate we're not getting through to people because they're afraid of the jargon. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true, and I mean, when I think of the examples that really strike me of how that openness works out um, in my own practice, um, this spring I did a course with uh, contract grading, and I went looking for people who had done it. I found Kathy Davidson's mm. work at Duke, and started with her contract grading contract, which she had just openly published. It wasn't work together again. I know who Kathy Davidson is. I know that I know some of her work. I took it by the time I was finished with it, it looked totally different. And there are five or six other people who came along behind me and from my blog found that and started yeah. to go it out. So it works through those networks of connection. And I think that, you know, we we're talking about libraries this morning. One of the challenges, if we think about it like a library, here's the official stuff. Mm. We run into the challenge that you're talking about. To me, without the networks of trust, there's no way to spread the information because mm. it has to spread along the trust network. Mm. Yeah. Anytime, unless we assume that the institutions, like everybody's going to use Oxford stuff. Yeah. Like unless yeah. we do it that way. I mean, if you look at the the stuff that's come out of the Secretary mm. of Education in, in your oh, country, yeah. essentially they're looking at OER as a form of imperialism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And there's that in there too. So yeah. Yeah. Well, let's cool. call this the official one over here and we'll yeah. all use that one. I mean, MIT has been at that for eight years yeah. now, or ten years now, since uh, since '01 actually. Yeah. The first um, OCW. Yeah. What do you say to a teacher who is a bit reluctant to get started? Why should I be open? I think, like anything that you're doing, I, I'm not going to lie to you and say that it's going to be easy off the beginning. What I will tell you is that once you get into the process and you get through that first initial painful period, because it's going to be there, your life gets easier. Mm. You have people you can work with. It's just like walking into that staff room full of friends who go, oh, I know what you need. It's this thing. Except that those staff room full of friends aren't people who teach different courses than you or whatever else. They're people who are just like you. And once you make those connections, your life gets easier. Yeah, and I'd say the you know in answer to that question, why should I go open? Um, the sort of resistance or uncomfort somebody might feel you know be feeling about openness. That's exactly the reason why you should go open because you'll never be kind of left out of the development ever again. You that's it. You are part of a network. Once you're open, you develop your networks. You are constantly developing as a professional, and things will never be scary again. No, because the network will support you. Mm -hmm. You'll get so much support from all these people yeah. who want to help you, yeah. who want to bring you along, who want to invite you in, and. Suddenly, you know, you 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 it, they lift you. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Yeah. If you just show willingness to take part yeah. and share and yeah. share.